very first point of specific clarity that we need to understand before we get into the mechanics of an escape is that there are a lot of people who selectively take the research they want to support the view they have. And there is one area that drives me absolutely insane that I see consistently. People will say, oh, we train slowly, you know, particularly in the Russian martial arts and Sistema, and they say uh, their research shows that the brain doesn't know the difference between slow and fast training, that motor behavior can be acquired just as well, if not faster, under slow training. Guys, this is true of motor skill, acquisition. We know that if there is too much pressure, the brain can't learn. This is talking about an initial skill. We know that mental short-term mem memory retrieval is deeply hampered by stress. So if I'm shooting at you and beating you and asking you to you know, learn how to drive in a snowstorm, not gonna be the best time to learn. Absolutely. That's not what the education phase is supposed to be. If we talk about learning guitar and we talk about learning fingering very, very slowly, absolutely, we can train it slowly, we can perform the rehearsal phase and re repeat and repeat and get our thousands of repetitions in and become amazing. None of that is going to improve your ability to play guitar on stage in front of a thousand people when the pressure is on. What is going to improve that capacity is pressure. Now I want to be very clear here because people often misconstrue this. Under conditions of slowness, ideal, ideal circumstances, we have two advantages that do not exist in a real crisis. The first is that we have way too much processing time. We can clearly see things, always engage our cognitive brain, have time to select a response, and make it. Neurotransmitters behave very differently under conditions of stress. Under conditions of stress, we know that short-term memory gets affected. We know that memory retrieval gets affected. And the only way to improve our ability to retrieve memory and access long-term memory under stress is by exposing those actions to stress. We know scientifically that somebody that does not perform pressure testing, who does not feel failure, who does not have a breakdown of skill, who does not perform within the critical threshold of failure and success in teetering balance, again, not learned helplessness where we're completely useless, but where we're oscillating between succeeding and failing, it's messy, but we're still good enough and we're getting through. People that do not perform in that critical zone do not get better at performing at that critical zone. Number one, processing. Number two, physics. Under conditions of slowness, we can perform trajectories and we have time, capacity, response time, and performance time that doesn't exist. We know that if we talk about the best versus the rest, the most elite performers in the world can operate somewhere around 80% faster than an average layman. We know this. It's a big difference. But it's not seconds of difference. An 80 to 82% difference in processing speed does not mean that I can intercept your jab with 15 counter hits while you stay there dumbly, like a zombie. It does not mean that I can step, block, deflect, destroy, trap, and counter hit. I'm not 10 times faster. I'm 82% faster. And we know that that 82% speed difference isn't really in muscle behavior. It's in mental processing. It's in learning how to look correctly and where to look. We're gonna talk about vision in this download. And it's about correctly predicting where something is going to go, what's about to happen, identifying cues sooner and making the right decision faster. That's where the 82% difference comes from. And guess how those 82% faster elite performers get that speed advantage? By understanding the education phase, by doing the rehearsal phase ad nauseum, but then by practicing and exposing themselves to pressure and failure and stress repeatedly. And I've said it elsewhere, Daniel Coyle in The Talent Code talks about our neurons and he says we need them to fire, we need them to fail, and we need them to be fixed 
fire, fail, fix, fire, fail, fix. If we are not failing, if we are not feeling discomfort and despair, if we are not going back to the drawing board, scratching our heads, making hard decisions, using the scalpel of experience to remove all the fat, all the excess, then we are not pressure testing. So when I hear people saying, well, I train slowly because there's no difference and actually I have more time to make correct decisions, that's true in the early rehearsal phase. But when you understand a movement, it's time to add pressure, guys. If we dwell in ideal rehearsal phase fantasy land, we're not getting any better or any more ready for reality. So yes, maybe you're older. I'm getting older all the time. Yes, maybe you have injuries, limitations. Yes, but guys, pressure doesn't mean you need to get injured. It doesn't mean you need to go as hard as I'll go on this video. It means you need to go hard enough to feel failure. You could go to a BJJ gym, get pinned by a bigger guy who's not cranking your limbs, who's kind, who's nice, who's giving you the pressure you can take, but who's making you panic and feel despair. And if they're kind and a good training partner, they give you just enough space to recover and breathe. They coach you through it. They talk you through it. Then once you start regaining your momentum, they crush you down a little bit again. And again, there's no harm in despair. Maybe it's bad for the brain a little bit, a little bit hurtful for the ego, but it's not gonna leave lasting marks if it's done in a correct way. It's not gonna endanger your joints. So there's a difference between pressure testing and wounding our people, wounding our followers. Mark Denny, uh, one of the founders of the Dog Brothers, famously said that we are a tribe. And as a tribe, we are vulnerable to attack by enemy tribes at any point. And our goal, must be to push ourselves and to train ourselves hard enough that every member of our tribe is always getting better, that they know their limitations, what they can do and what they can't do. But we never want to push so hard that the members of our tribe get wounded and place the tribe at a disadvantage should we get attacked now. So we are training with partners and friends and colleagues, not with enemies. And if you don't have that feeling, you shouldn't be training in that environment. Do not wound your partners and mistake or excuse or justify that as training, as toughness. It's not. It's stupidity. Okay? We need to make sure we are training smart, intelligently, but passionately and hard. We need to respect our limits. We need to find how we can feel pressure. No age, no limitation, no injury, no body type is immune to pressure. There is a safe level of pressure that's going to be a little bit hard to swallow, be a little bit scary, but it's going to be safe for your body, right? And this is what we need. That's what Mike and Baum is talking about when he talks about that, you know, that, that pressure leading back to a re-education phase, or Coyle is talking about when he talks about the fail and fix after the fire. We need this, guys. So whenever people respond saying, oh, Kevin does slow training, I believe in slow training too. Yes, I believe in slow training. There are gyms that never put in the slow training. They always go too hard, too fast, and you don't learn. You just get injured. You need intelligence. You need biomechanical refinement. You need to practice vision, practice breathing, look at psychology, learn where to look, learn what cues mean. You need all of that, slowly at first, and then rehearsal. And when you have a failure, sometimes you gotta slow down even more. But once you have it, you gotta speed up incrementally, slowly, progressively, add pressure, fail in equal parts with success, correct? Otherwise, guys, unicorn land, you're drinking leprechaun piss and it's complete fantasy. So when people say, well, we train slowly all the time because what we do is too deadly to go full speed, it's bullshit, <laughs> it's bullshit. The formula has been proven Boxers can train slowly most of the time, but when they pressure test, they pressure test and they succeed. And when they go back to the drawing board, they're only slow training and rehearsing movements that they were able to reproduce under stress. They are not going for 17 strike combinations against a single jab because that is never reproducible under stress. And that formula continues to be misunderstood. There are people out there that, that tout the formula, that express the formula, and claim that they're representing it, and then embody the most fantasy-based, pegasus-winged martial art delusion that I've ever seen. So be honest with yourself. Look at your work. It doesn't need to be complicated. It doesn't need to be dangerous. There is always a way for us to pressure test and to improve.